Hi, I just watched an excellent video on the nature of infinity by Sabine Hassenfelder, and I'll share the link here. You really should watch it. I think she has a number of fresh ideas that explain things that a lot of us claim we already know very well. Because of that, I'm kind of inspired to talk a little about numbers and math anxiety. So basically, math anxiety is this feeling that you're the only one in the room not getting the joke. And that's because as mathematicians, we often say that there's a small number of apodictic or inevitable structures that all of us understand very well and you don't seem to be getting just yet. And that's kind of unfair because that's really not what's going on in mathematics. So numbers is what we claim to be simple and without stress. And actually that is not the case. So we can start with counting numbers like one, two, three, and already we have a couple of issues. Is zero such a number? Um, the Greeks' formal mathematics even had some controversy as whether one was a number of the same nature as the later numbers. Obviously they knew how to count, but for certain formal mathematics, one had enough different properties that they were actually somewhat suspicious of it. And as um, we've seen, the ability to count gets you quickly into infinite sets. That for any proposed size set of numbers, like one through seven, you can say there's a larger set than numbers one through eight. So you rapidly get into processes that don't end and trying to characterize processes that don't end. So even the natural numbers are a pretty complicated mathematical structure. Now, we then move on to another set of numbers, the rationals. And these are all the numbers that can be written as A over B, where A and B are integers, and B doesn't equal zero. Now again, the integers is just the natural numbers plus numbers of minus signs. Now again, the negative numbers, you know, do they exist in nature? Like, is there negative one magic markers out there that I take a magic marker and an anti-magic marker and I get nothing, and not even the burst of energy that an antimatter magic marker would give. So really, the physical basis of negative numbers is from our arithmetic, not from physical world. So the rational numbers are all the numbers we can write as the fractions. We taught this way, but they're really all the pairs, with this being what it is, this being our understanding of it. And we say two rational numbers are equal if the ratio of A to B is the same as C to D. Or equivalently, AD equals BC. So we get the rationals are actually pairs of integers with this one restriction, b is not zero, subject to an equivalence relation that two of these pairs are considered identical if this check equation holds. So already we're playing our favorite mathematical trick of moving to equivalence classes, which is somewhat difficult for the beginner. Equivalence classes is a great technique, but it makes things complicated. So basically, that's a very long-winded way of saying the fraction one-half is the same as the fraction two-fourths. We can't stop at the rational numbers, unfortunately, because they're missing a lot of numbers as far as we're concerned. For instance, we believe there should be a number x such that x squared equals 2, or the square root of 2. That is not a number in the rational numbers. So we build a larger set of numbers called the reals. The reals are built from the rational numbers by filling in the holes, basically taking limits of sequences of numbers, and when if the limit doesn't terminate, bounded limit doesn't terminate in the rationals, then it's evidence of a missing number. For instance, we could take all the numbers that are less than root two in the rationals, And this is a set of numbers that has a rightmost limit point, squared 2, that's not in the rational numbers. So this is evidence of a hole in the rational numbers. So the reals is just taking in the rational numbers and filling in all the holes. However, that statement hides pure terror. Because I said that nicely just to make it soft, 
but there are more holes than points. The real numbers are much larger than the rational numbers. So there are more holes to fill in than points that built the holes. And you can say, hey, infinity is exactly the set of sets that are equal to different sized sets, and that's entirely right. That, that is actually one of the definitions of infinity, is that a, it can be mapped onto a subset of itself, an infinite set, or a subset of itself can be mapped onto it. For instance, the natural numbers is the same size as all the integers, um, even though this has a lot of symbols this one doesn't have, because we can think of a mapping, and that would map the natural numbers onto the integers, showing the integers are no larger than natural numbers for our simple notions of infinity. We're saying the reals are much bigger. There is no way to map the rationals onto the reals. The reals just are very large. Um, so already we've got some problems. Now, once we have these ones, and if we have the idea that solving equations or taking limits are two ways to find new numbers, we get a lot of other interesting new numbers. Like we say, well, shouldn't there be an x such that x squared equals negative 1? There's certainly no real number that does that. If you do that, you get the complex numbers. And those are formally pairs of numbers, a, b, usually written as a plus b, i, where i is just a symbol. And a is the real part. They're, these two entries are both taken from the reals. And b is the imaginary part. So that buys you a lot. A lot of mathematics based on that. Pretty exotic system, the complex numbers. Or, this is another interesting one, shouldn't there be an x where x is not equal to 0? What if there were more solutions to this equation? And this gets you the dual numbers, which are pretty exotic. Most people haven't heard of them. They're a, b, written as a plus epsilon b. And they're under the convention that epsilon is a formal symbol whose square is 0. So this is not what we call a field, because there are 0 divisors, things that are not 0, that when multiplied by something, perhaps even their self, create 0. So this is the dual numbers. Very strange number system. But if you invent the dual numbers, you invent the entire field of automatic differentiation, and you invent backprop, which is how neural nets compute gradients for optimization. So trying these different incompatible numbers Extensions gives you different things. And I'm going to do one last extension. Robinson's hyperreals are um, non standard reals. So these are called um, the non standard reals. And they add infinitesimals back into the real number system so that we can um, do calculus without having to take limits. And so we have basically. At least four, this is, again is a very exotic number system. This is, is only invented in the 1960s, and it is only taught to specialists. So when the calculus was invented, both Leibniz and Newton used special numbers called infinitesimals that behaved a lot like the dual numbers, that they were very small, and squaring them made them even smaller. And so they basically, this is how they did their calculus. Now, this was criticized out of existence by Berkeley and Cantor, that these um, infinitesimals were basically not being used very well or very consistently, that if you calculated with them correctly, you got the right answer. If you did it wrong, you got the wrong answer. And that was very unacceptable in mathematics. So basically, you would see somebody take an equation of the form, uh, the infinitesimal, also called a fluxion. And you would pass this around to compute derivatives, and then you would negate it out once you were done calculating. And that was what Berkeley attacked. It turns out, I thought there were huge paradoxes made by computing with fluxions or infinitesimals, but there's not. There's just bad calculations that didn't go well. And this is what I really liked about, um, or one of the many things I really liked about uh, Sabine Hoffenfelder's, Hoffenfelder's sorry, talk, is she talked about infinities, we don't keep track of where they come from, therefore you can't calculate with them. But if you tracked where they come from, you can. So she said things like, it's obvious that the limit of x squared over e to the x as x goes to infinity or just becomes very large numbers, this quantity is 0. We can compute this 
though we can't compute this. And this is exactly the problem the Fluxians ran into. They were a reified number being very small. So 1 over O, no, it's not 0, it's a Fluxian, would have been infinity. So it's very large. And the existence of numbers that are larger than any integer, that's called a non-Archimedean property. Basically, the axiom saying there are no super large or super small numbers is called the Archimedean axiom. These non-Archimedean systems are hard to calculate in if you're not careful. And forcing this limit in as an explicit, deliberately awkward step is what makes it careful. And what Berkeley's criticism came down to is the limit of x squared over the limit of e to the x is not the same as the limit of the ratio. That you couldn't write lim x squared x goes to infinity as over lim x goes to infinity e to the x. That this quantity doesn't make sense and this quantity does make sense though we like to be able to exchange or commute operators like this. Limit is sufficiently awkward, we don't expect to do that, but Fluxian was too fluid that you did expect to do that. So this was the complaint, that sometimes you treat the Fluxian like it's there, and sometimes remove it, which back to our complex numbers, we now do that regularly, that we'll take the real part of a complex number and throw away the other bit. So they just didn't have a notation telling them where to throw away. Back to our Robinson on standard numbers, these don't require this notation. They have the infinitesimals in here, but they have so many of them, they can track where the infinities or where the arbitrary small numbers came. So these numbers have enough detail to remember where they came from. So these, this number system, you can do your calculus in it without ever having to write limit, which is a great thing, and it's actually how the authors of the calculuses did this. Now here's the point where I actually want to get off the math anxiety and the point of my lecture. Most mathematicians, and we'll say here's finite sets, say one, two, three is one finite set. Most mathematicians believe all of these structures make sense if studied. This one might take a semester, this might be a semester in analysis, this might be grade school and high school. Each of these systems makes sense in a mathematical sense. However, I believe, and I believe many mathematicians believe, at some point as you move from finite sets to the natural numbers, to the rationals, to the reals, to the non-standard reals, at some point you've gone crazy. And most mathematicians, I assume, would put the division here. However, I believe some, a minority, may put the division here. That your discomfort level or your anxiety should be peaking as you move from system to system to system. All of these are valid systems, but you should start panicking somewhere in this region. And that's the point I wanted to make, that numbers, which we claim are the simplest object in mathematics, are actually pretty complex, require their own study, have a fairly detailed history where informal operations that made sense a long time ago and then were abandoned because we had a formal operation that was clunkier but worked better proofs can come back with different mathematical structures. And that's my notion on numbers, especially how they interact with infinity. And uh, thank you very much for your time.